we are speaking of the problem of unity of mankind and yesterday we showed how it is related to his vision of a man's fulfillment on earth. An omnipresent reality is the basis of this cosmos and the manifestation of this omnipresent reality has taken Metaphysically, it takes up three positions, but in actuality, in actual evolution, it takes three positions. The, the individual, the collectivity, and the possible realization of unity that is in the offing. And uh, we, we saw that uh, the individual and the collectivity, collectivity is necessary for uh, an intermediate stage between one and the many. If the one is to pass into many, it does not take place all at once from one to the many, but one to a number of groups and the group, each group again giving rise to individuality. So that the transition from one to the many is not done in one step or one jump, so to say. That is what we saw yesterday. Now, till we take up directly the question of uh, what is the drive towards this unity which we see today? Well, apparent drive is due to the great progress of science and application of reason to life, individual life of man and collective life of man. You see, the, the science has made such a progress that the individual and the collectivity, social life, national life, international life is driven towards, compulsorily driven towards unity. And that is one great factor which makes for unity. Only the obstacles are that because if it relies only on scientific means, then the means will be mechanical, that is one. And even if it resorts to social and political institutions or social and political methods of bringing about the unity, even that will be external. What is needed is not a constitutional movement which will bring about a unity. What is needed is not merely some social or political institution which will want to or bring about unity. What is wanted is a psychological sense and inner reality of unity. That is to say, oneness of human race felt as a psychological factor. That mere scientific progress or social or political method will fail to bring because social and even political methods are outward, external. They try to change the man from outside and therefore the effort to bring about unity from political or economic or, you know, social uh, reforms or changes or methods will always be lacking the spirit of it, which is psychological, a sense of, a living sense of unity of mankind. Well, that is what is to be created. The drive is by science rendering the obstacle to the minimum because communication between man and man, thought, you know, thought communication, man-to-man -man relation, state-to-state -state relation has become now practically, well, has annihilated time and space. You can always know what is happening in the farthest corner of the world. And events which were not known before and not valued as important have now assumed such an importance that uh, anything happening in any corner of the globe has universal repercussions, repercussions all over the world. I gave you the instance of uh, how the result of Battle of Waterloo reached India five months after to the Governor General. The public did perhaps know, did know it after, uh, came to know it after one year, I don't know when. But the Governor General received the first report of Battle of Waterloo five months after. This is a fact from history I am telling you. Now you can imagine how much change has taken place from that time to now when you look. When you can hear somebody being killed in Africa just now, one hour after the event has taken place, and you have your reaction, your opinion, or whatever you want to do. If an organization is there, you can immediately take part in it. So the scientific progress has rendered communication so easy, so instantaneous and common, that uh, now the drive towards unity can be greatly helped by this mechanical progress. But only mechanical means does not bring about unity is known very well now because that same progress led to two world wars. So that it wouldn't always necessarily, because it is scientific progress, it would not therefore mean, mean movement towards unity, it might mean towards destruction. 
it can be equally a much stronger power for destruction so and also political and social methods would be only external would not succeed unless there was a living sense of psychological unity a feeling of oneness of humanity well that is what is to be created but this can help and secondly a question can arise in some minds as to why there should be unity at all when you study the progress of small group small collectivities like greek the greek city states or if you go to india some of the indian you know republics in early times 2600 years before they were contemporaneous to gautam buddha's existence now if you take those you will find that they were more creative the larger the aggregate that grows the more complicated becomes the organization is it not it requires a machinery for running it and uh, you know the more and more uh, red tape rules constitution and organizational part has to be well brought into existence so a, a smaller aggregate is certainly more creative well the defect of the small aggregates were there they were they had advantages they had disadvantages also you see there were disorders in the smaller greek city states and also they were not able to defend themselves against aggression of powerful neighbors you see they could not defend so that 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 part being given weakness well the bigger units make elaborate administrations necessary organizational and machinery part which diffuses the whole you see does not bring about that intensity you know which a, which a small unit can put forth now nation unit seems to be the one that has come to stay and one that has got a chance of lasting the we have watched yesterday, so I won't repeat for our saving the time, that it began, the collective life, evolution of collective life began, a life in which common interests are involved. Thirdly, a conscious mind or a sense of unity, a feeling we are all one in some way. These are now common, the second element, that is to say, the, the common life. It is on this that nation existence is formulated by the states, common interests, you see, a common life in which economics and, you know, all the other things find their place. In Britain, for instance, the first element geographical is there and still you find wells not <laughs> one. In Holland, for instance, there is a one geography, but uh, Belgium and Holland are not one. So you find uh, Sweden and Norway, the geographically a unit still are not one. He's point out that that is not necessarily the criterion, but it has its own basis in the physical. The problem of federated... Today what is needed, he says, at the end of this chapter is that the creation of a human culture with contribution of each culture and not resorting to military force or political pressure. Adaptation and interchange are what is needed. New births from old elements and this is being now fortunately recognized more and more in mankind because of wider knowledge, dissemination of knowledge, communication, value of variation also being accepted more and more. And seeds are being sown for the new age. No nation is now considered inferior to any other, or at least should not be. And Europe and Asia can meet on, on a common ground. And he says that even now the continental unity is, is now overpassed by man's consciousness. Even continents need not unite. Uh, European Continental Union or African Continental Union or Asian Union is not necessary and not desirable. Uh, men's conscience has already gone beyond that to the one world already. But uh, in spite of lines of demarcation and lines of special temperament and special cultural strand, all cultures can come together, just as he illustrates by saying how 
the culture of Asia and Europe can come together. He said they can come together on the principle of equality and on the principle of unity. Political unity is secured by common interest. That's first. Secondly, sound commercial interchange and mutual industrial helpfulness, which is coming. And thirdly, new cultural relations to build a human unity by contributing the special strain of the culture evolved by the collective or nation life to make a rich world unity and a human culture. Well, no more the possibility of empire seems to be possible now. He, he has written to, about uh, the aggregates, you see, in the eighth chapter. He has cited the example of France that France had an idea of French beyond the seas, you see. Attends, entente française, they say famille, they say family, you see, French family, they used to say. The French had the idea of France beyond the seas, which implied the inclusion of other races also in the fold of French family. They wanted that uh, Africans, and that is what they meant by, you know, metropolitan, France extended to Africa. In fact, Algeria was regarded the 18th province of France and uh, treated as 18th province. Uh, literally, when France that way is not, uh, not uh, deceptive, uh, she was not insincere except the colonials who were in, in Algeria. Mm -hmm. It's the French uh, colonists who settled in Algeria who broke the, the constitution and didn't allow it to work perfectly. But French had always regarded Algeria as an integral part of France and treated as such. In fact, in Paris, you find the greatest thing you find, find some of the people who had the superiority idea till yesterday, what they find is a shocking presence of colored people <laughs> in a city like Paris. Yes, it's quite shocking. They, they, they are, but French people never take notice of it. Socially, there is such an equality. There may be inequality in their own other spheres of life, but socially, the perfect equality. The French always treat anybody else who differs in their culture or color on terms of equality. And this, this is uh, one thing which the French wanted to bring about by um, in admitting other people who take French constitution. Their idea is, are you a citizen, citoyen, citoyen Francais? Well, then you are a Frenchman. And uh, why my friend was there in 14th of July once in Paris, when the procession of the, you know, July 14th is a Bastille Day, Day of Freedom. So they were taking out and the, the Negro Senegalese troop was passing and my friend asked the Frenchman, who are these people? He said, Frenchman. And my friend was glad, he was surprised and happy. Actually, he asked them, who are these people? He said, they're Frenchmen. Well, that was the reply of a Frenchman, <laughs> you see? Well, that, this idea was there in France and it would be an empire in which races that accept the French culture and accept the French constitution, look up to France as a mother country, would all be admitted. Well, Sierundo here in this chapter feels doubtful about the success of this idea now. It may have perhaps worked out if France had possessed the genius of doing the right thing at the right time, as the English generally have shown in their history, you see, to muddle through a situation. Well, uh, the France don't seem to French don't seem to have known that, and it's due to that being too too intellectual. You see, they, their argument is they, an Englishman will give up logic. You see, if it has come to that, because compromise, you must immediately understand this is to be done, whether logical or not. But French will always say logic. He will always say say logic. It is it is rational. <laughs> he will ruin the whole project on that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, it, as things are, the idea has, doesn't seem to be successful. The nation idea is too strong for the races of Africa beyond the seas. The nation idea has took, taken hold of the Africans now, and they want to feel themselves as separate nations. England, who is a pioneer in colonial empire, freed Egypt, Iraq, and after the First World War, India, Burma, and Ceylon after the Second, whereas France, those somewhere in the national consciousness genuinely wanting to include the Africans and other races in the family, 
has failed to move with the time spirit. It is very regrettable and tragic. Well, it is after inviting a crisis in her own constitution that she has had to delegate dictatorial power to General de Gaulle in order to solve the Algerian problem, isn't it? <laughs> he indicated that Asia and Europe would come together in spite of some differences that are apparent and so on. I think that brings us to the almost the end of the exposition, except one or two, that unity of mankind has come to the fore after the First World War, and the indication seems to be that it should be, if it is to succeed, a free federation of nations. A free federation of nations, a free association, that is to say, and it would require great psychological changes. Just as in the nation, the law is maintained by force, so if this unity of mankind comes to become real, then some force will be required to maintain order between nations, isn't it? And that's what they tried in Congo. You see, I don't know with what success now, because I've been out of touch with papers for the last three months. So I don't know what has happened to the world in the meantime. <laughs> and that means to say the collective <laughs> national egoism will have to undergo a change. In fact, it is undergoing a change. Nation sovereignty is being compromised. That no nation can claim sovereignty. Sovereignty of nation is not allowed. Because it means destruction of mankind or destruction of the nation itself. That's, that's one. So the, the collective ego of the nation must allow limitations. And if such a unity comes into existence on the world scale, the difficulty is that it might crush the national consciousness and also the individual freedom. If you bring a powerful national unity of mankind into existence with so much power and a, a high end constitution, it might crush down the nation unity, national consciousness and also crush the individual freedom. That is one danger. And thirdly, you see, it might only be economic, political and administrative unity, you see, and it might not bring about psychological unity, the soul, into existence. These are the three dangers of this federation that is in the offing, that is all, because the earth, he says, seems to be in travail of one common, large and flexible civilization for the whole mankind. That is what the earth is, seems to be trying to bring to birth. And each ancient and modern culture shall bring its contribution as a necessary element of variation. And happy sign is that exchange is already taking place. And uh, the, the exchange between Europe and Asia and Europe and other countries and well, on a scale where equality is being taken and variation is being, being felt necessary, well, the conditions are molding towards that with the three possible defects or difficulties or obstacles that can stand in the way. National egoism, crushing of the nation and individual freedom by a attained powerful unity of the human race. And thirdly, the unity might tend to become only economic, administrative, political, lacking the soul of the race, is the soul of humanity. And that's brings you to the end of the night chapter. How are you now? Come along. Um. Where one one individual refused to pay his taxes and changed yes. the whole uh, situation. Well, that that became the, the Hampden. His name is Hampden. It's well known in England in English yeah. history. Well, yes. this same thing. Uh, the question I'll bring up in a minute, but the same thing has happened here. Mm. Uh, the former governor of Utah has re refused. To pay. I don't know how far behind he is in back income tax because mm. he says it's mm. unconstitutional. Mm. But nothing has happened. I mean. Mm. So far, we're, we're but still, what did the court say? The the I mean the Supreme Court. Well, they're just charging him interest, but they haven't uh, collected. They haven't collected. Hmm. This has been going on for years now, and several hmm. years. No, but uh, it's not reference been made to the to the Supreme Court because the issue must be decided by the Supreme Court. Yes, we lost. They confiscated. Oh. 
Oh. Well, then he has either to change the law, it's all uh, work it up like that. If if that is true, I mean, if it is a point of conscience, he has to get a number of persons to con to to join him if he can persuade them to, and that's the only way to to upset the 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 circle. I mean the the circuit that is going on. This is very difficult, you know, collective life. Once you create, you have to, it is a vicious circle that goes round and round and you have to, somebody has to get up and, and get a following at a number and go through suffering and difficulties. One thing that our infantry set up is a, an emergency, a national emergency has never been reduced. I mean, is it the constitutional thing? At least there were many people who seemed to feel that he had a point. Mm. And again, goes to mm. What they have to do is to stand up those who feel like that. And if there's a collective non-payment of taxes, there will be effect. That's what Gandhi did in India. The government wouldn't be able to meet its debts because it's already weighing down. But it's you know, what happens. <laughs> Yeah, stop some of this giving away. <laughs> I was reading. That's where the shoe has been. Yeah. Where every American child is born now, the day he's born, he owes nineteen hundred dollars on the national debt. E. Charlie, does this um, or this soul? You think what? That's will get born in India. <laughs> no, but then you will have greater debt. <laughs> 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 yeah. An Indian child born as per se debt which he will never pay and he is never bothered about it because he knows he's not going to pay. Thank you. <laughs> 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 well, I think you would really like to go get uh, in the so that um that would um, would happen if we had the realization of uh, if we had an uh, international I mean we have one world. Yes. Does that soul have to come first from inside before yes, it comes yes, outside? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That is what he's pleading for. In fact, yeah. the whole book is centered around the need of creating the psychological entity before any constitutional or outer machinery, because it will only remain outer. Yes. That's it. And that makes the widest possible organization of collective life possible on earth. The highest unit is humanity. Yes. The highest uh, unit is human race, and identification or oneness with the race would be the realization of the highest collective entity on earth. Yeah. And that is why it, he has put it in his program because the creation of divine life requires a very radical change in collective consciousness. Now the collective consciousness is centered around national ego. What he wants is that it must be national soul. And when the national soul is in operation, then there will be no opposition to human unity. Because each national national soul is a personality of the, of the human entity, human race. It is one part projected into the nation unit, so that there will be no opposition between the nation soul and the human unity, human soul. And this is an indispensable step for realizing divine life on earth. It's just fascinating the way all these mm -hmm. things. You see, because downtail. unless and until you get this, this, this widening of collective consciousness, atmosphere will not be there. That is exactly what you are pleading for in America. That's what we are telling for us. Apart from the problem of human unity, when we think of bringing a divine element into life, the greatest obstacle that we feel is the prevalence of an atmosphere which does not allow one to, yes. to dedicate himself to that life or to put that as an item in his life, a practical item or priority in his life. How far collectivity can prevent the realization of a spiritual ideal, you can see. That's why with a far greater vision of a real seer, he put this program of human unity as necessary part of his life divine on earth. Life divine is only a philosophical exposition for metaphysics. But he knew that in active life when you were to realize it, 
well the collective consciousness of man must rise to the highest possible unit attainable on earth which is unity of mankind till that widening takes place there will not be atmosphere for a large scale manifestation of divine life you can always have a beginning as pondicherry has and as said, one dozen points in world must have. I am perfectly sure there are people who are very sincere about uh, bringing a divine element in their own life and are trying and are partly successful. But what we are envisaging is a large scale movement of human beings trying to live their soul life and organizing life on the basis of their psychic being or their, their divine spark within them. But for that an atmosphere is necessary, collective atmosphere. And that could be provided if this national ego becomes, you know, well, it wears out or widens out into a larger, you know, consciousness. Then man will be able to, to, to create a, a, an atmosphere in which his attainment of inner truth, reality or supreme divinity within him will become easily possible. Well, it is a part of his program. It is not merely a philosophy that he has put forward. It is not, as people think, oh, it's a philosophic thinking. It's not. It is very much, you know, con connected with his practical program. People who don't know and are not serious about it always think oh, it is philosophy. It is not. It is very intimately and organically connected with his program of divine life on earth. If the divinity in man is to manifest in individual life, the collectivity must create the atmosphere and the, the way in which collectivity can create the atmosphere is by realizing unity of mankind. That is for all. He doesn't obviate the possibility of individual realizing divine life. Please note. And small groups, individual realizing divine life. And small groups also realizing divine life because um, they can always fight against the atmosphere and do it. But we are thinking of the whole mankind and in each nation or each continent people who want to devote themselves to higher pursuit of culture or spiritual life then there must be an atmosphere and that atmosphere is the unity of mankind that will give them the atmosphere in which they will be easily able to well attend to this uh, higher values of life otherwise uh, there will be a cramp you know and there will be a a limitation in the whole effort which is there you can see it here that uh, in in uh, with such a i mean possibility of organizing economic and outer life on on easy terms in america very few are able to do it should be possible here if it is anywhere in the world an outer organization of life in which one is freed at least for some time every day to devote himself to spiritual pursuit and it is exactly that which doesn't happen. Yearning, that searching. Yeah, that of course. It is that that must press ultimately either in two directions, either in one's own organization of individual life or in change of collective life. So that if unity of mankind comes, then the the sharp problems of nations will be worn out. You see, conflict will be ruled out. One most important thing. Fight and war will be ruled out when unity of mankind is realized in soul and becomes organized in sort of a constitution or some machinery. The first thing is, is war will go. Well, that will make available a large economic, you know, wealth available for new creation, new construction. You imagine the budgets without military and you will see what it would mean. <laughs> <laughs> Those force will be necessary. Each nation will have some, you know, force for law and order within its border. And perhaps the collectivity, means a human unity, might have also contingents there, either promised or available to them on, on, on notice. That, that, that will have to be done. But it will be much less than what people have in their idea of conflict in their mind. Our conflict is a possibility of conflict always looming. When that is ruled out, well, the only problem is that if some local nation or local problem creates some difficulty, the collectivity must have sufficient force to put it down. Just as they tried in Congo, you see, to take battalions from different nations of the United Nations and uh, to put down the local resistance, you see. That may have to be done. 
for 10, 15, or 20 years, perhaps, because some nations are not yet fully formed. The problem in Africa is the transition from the tribal state to the nation. They have not yet developed into nationhood. The problem in Africa is not interference at all, but they are not developed. They are living in tribal mind, tribal consciousness, one tribe against the other and you know, trying to dominate and their rivalries for centuries together. And it is that that is a problem. They are not widened out into nation, nationhood yet. And where they have, they are quite all right, like Nigeria. You see, where they have widened out into a collective consciousness of nation, well, there are no difficulties. It is when they are in the tribal state that you have difficulties. And one good point which Eisenhower did was that he put it down as a almost a point of policy that uh, no military militarization of Africa must take place, which was very good. You see that uh, you shouldn't uh, put African continent on the map of military you know, strategy because that will again uh, it might give you industrial, you know, uplift and industrial, what you call a drive for some time. But ultimately it will spell disaster in the sense that it will invite a greater clash. Let African, uh, I mean European and American you know, nations keep off the military force from Africa and allow it to develop without military intervention. You mentioned that the I stated that transfer of values from one soul to another is real teaching. Is this uh, possible in its fullest in mass education as we have in this country? Well, that's, that proves the whole problem. Is why should there be mass education? You see, we have to go to the root of the problem. Well, that's my question. Yes. Should there and, be? Uh, well, I think that... Uh, there is, it is possible if, if people understand what is education to decentralize it completely and to, to decentralize education completely and to provide institutions where rich equipment is, is necessary for the growth to provide institutions like hospital or laboratory or, you know, where you require equipment to provide only that but to decentralize education and make it free to the people. The state must take uh, education in hand where it finds that people are not able to, to take up education. Otherwise, state must withdraw. You must not take up education. In fact, I think that in America there is a lot of private initiative in that direction, is it not? Just, uh, I don't know because many of the universities are not state universities. They are not owned by the state, are they? No. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so that, that, that way it is, it is one sense good. Now these very institutions must now make up their idea about policy of education. They can decentralize. Being private, it is open to them to, to change that policy of educating and say that we are going to, to attend to the development of the individual, not to passing of information and technique. And the technique has become now so advanced that the, the specialization in technique takes years. And the only thing he comes out is a specialist at the end and not an integrated, full grown human being. So, when he is a specialist of radio or cancer or, you know, some particular electronics, as they say, you ask him about for whom he is going to vote. He doesn't know. He has been 10 years in the work all the time and you say well, what to do about certain problem. He is only doing radio or electronics or cancer. So he knows only what to do when cancer is there. <laughs> Before he goes in for that special education, he must have been equipped with certain humanities. Not that specialization is not necessary, but you must not produce only a specialist. You must produce a full-grown man with a specialization. Here, they are not full-grown. They are not capacity to judge a problem, judge a question when it comes for decision. No, probably at all. And they judge wrongly when, they, when somebody comes and says, you vote for this man, he will vote for him. They are not independent judgment. So they are trying. 
Mm -hmm. You know, in almost, I guess in all the colleges, they do have what they call the humanity. Mm -hmm. now. There probably is a movement in that direction. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's a movement towards a more general thing, uh, studies required first. At the university now, for the first two years, you, you don't take anything specialized. And, and it's extending so that you have more and more uh, general education before you're allowed to, to do the specialization. Yes, it, it is very necessary to to, to train the people with judgment and to people with, with the whole being. You see, otherwise you get into the world that you only know what you are taught and that line which you are following in industry or business and profession. And any general question that comes, well, you it's accident. Somebody tells you, or paper writes, or some leader comes, or some speaker tells, and then you do. You don't form an independent judgment because you have no data. You have no view of history, view of the past, view of the present, view of what people did before, what is to be done now, how it can be done. No idea. Ronnie, do you think that it would be uh, possible or practical for the first few years of the of, uh, children? Uh, study, they just um, reading and arithmetic basic to be taught by the parents, complete centralization with uh, textbooks and perhaps government administered tests available? Or is that. If the parents know how to educate, it means first of all they, they have to give that freedom to the child, which very few parents are prepared to give, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's what you see, the first law of education is freedom of the child. Yes, but shouldn't the, the family is, as I understand, the smallest entity of collective life? Yes. Shouldn't the parents be able to know best what their child is? Uh, they can know, but uh, normally parents as they are, I'm talking of normal you know, 90 out of 100 or something like that. Well, parents have first difficulties of attachment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great attachment. That prevents them from... Can't be objective then. Uh, yes, can't, that's one. And secondly, the, the wideness of outlook to give freedom to the child. You see, to give freedom to the child is the first thing to for an educator. If he is going to be a true education, it must be based on the freedom of the child. That's what Montessori said, and that's what in the ashram that is the basic principle on which we proceed. And we have built up an institution which shows that it can work. You can say, oh, if only you have special staff, but that's all right. All staff must be special staff. Why not? No, our contention would be, why not all teachers become special staff? After all, what is special stuff? You must be interested in education. A teacher who is only looking to his pay and promotion, well, he should take some other profession. And you must be interested in education, you see? You, try, you should try and tell us, say that, though, to the teachers. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> Hardly any free, which would be hard to... But Actually, they should differ in that respect, too. I think they really tried the Montessori method here, you know. Mm -hmm. And maybe the teachers weren't equal to it, or maybe the children were like, from this part of the world weren't... Uh, no, no, children are not at fault. I won't find fault with the children. Well, the Either the teachers were must be unfit, that's all. <laughs> anyhow, Karani, no. that um, children became completely undisciplined and all they wanted was the dessert. They didn't want to work towards it, you know, mm -hmm. gradually. I mean, I think that, that that has been the influence, don't you? In the yeah. Yeah. graphic education, that's all, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know what you feel, but yes, there seems to be quite a lot of that sort of undisciplined. They seem to be going back now to the more disciplined. Yeah. I don't know where the where the trouble lies. <laughs> you know, speaking of <laughs> private institutions, we need more private institutions instead of the state supported. Uh, our private educational institutions are having a hard time again because of taxation. Mm. I mean, they're all they're all in need of funds because. Private individuals are not giving as they were a uh, year back. Because money government also put control. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, we are not yet finished. Come to only eight chapters now. The process wait, is coming here. Yeah. Wait for the avalanche. <laughs> the avalanche is coming. <laughs> huh?